using New York City as a case study. And our hypothetical client is the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency. Unfortunately, uh, Mayor de Blasio couldn't make it today. Uh, but that'd be so we'd like to get straight into our agenda, what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be going through first our thesis, our core logic, into resiliency, a few definitions and concepts, um, then into hazards and disruptions, um, followed by methodology, so what we've been doing in the past four months, along with recommendations of our plan, and then we're going to focus in on a specific case study in New York City. So we'd also like to present our central capstone research question that has guided our semester, which is how can social resiliency be operationalized in New York City's climate resiliency agenda through the built environment? So there are a lot of terms here, and we're going to go through them, and hopefully this will be clear as we continue with our presentation. And this is also really important, right from the get-go, that this is the central thesis, the logic that has guided our findings, which is that built infrastructure informs and, and uh, is a conducive space for social networks, which then strengthen and enhance social resiliency. So this is something that should be kept in the back of your minds as we continue, is this connection between built infrastructure, social networks, and social resiliency. Great, so let's head into defining social, um, defining resiliency. There's a vast quantity of literature on resiliency with lots of overlapping definitions that embody different ideas and ways of thinking about the term. However, at its most simple, the, the, the definition of resiliency is the ability of a system to function optimally despite disruption. However, this definition is a little too general to be operationalized, so in order to create a more context-specific and nuanced definition of resiliency, we need to consider these four questions. What does it mean to function optimally? Is that the best way possible? Is that just enough to get by? Which is it? Um, what is optimal for whom? Who are the stakeholders involved in the system in creating resiliency? What constitutes a disruption? There's been a lot of talk in the literature primarily about disasters um, like flooding and storms, but there are other disruptions to a system like to heat waves or even just changes in a community social fabric that can also impact resiliency. And then finally, it's also important to consider what the context of the system that you are trying to make resilient is such as its historical context and um, So what are the qualities of a resilient system? First of all, a system must be redundant. There should be many aspects of a resilient system that perform the same function. So if any one of them fails, others can continue to produce them. Um, a resilient system should also be resourceful. The system should be cost effective, using the least amount of energy and resources for the most amount of a system should also be reflective, able to be continuously evolving. Um, the system should be inclusive in accounting for as many people as possible, especially those with more pronounced vulnerabilities. And finally, a resilient system should be flexible, able to change and adapt to any disruptions thrown its way. And often this means decentralizing the system to more effectively respond to those so we'd now like to focus in on social resiliency, which is really the core um, of our seminar and of our findings. And we've defined social resiliency, uh, where we, we find that social resiliency rests on the infrastructure of social and institutional connectivity needed for a community to mitigate, prepare for, respond to, adapt to, and recover from disruption. Social resiliency is both a form of risk mitigation and a means of overall community vitality. So at the core of social resiliency is community, are the people, are the humans that make up the city. And social infrastructure can be seen as the people, places, and institution that foster social cohesion and support. So social resiliency, once again, is all about the people, the networks that are formed. And now to why it matters. It matters for a number of reasons. And as I said before, community at the center of it. So literature shows that strong social networks are critical to community resiliency. And there are many examples of which we won't get into, but this ranges from a heat wave into Chicago, uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, uh, earthquakes in Japan and in India. So community resiliency is really at the core of social resiliency. Again, also is redundancy. So redundancy is accounting for people that may fall through the crack. So as we said, a general resilience system should be redundant, but social resiliency makes sure to account for all people. Um, regardless of the hazard or disruption. Empowered. So social resiliency is empowering because it gives a community 
the tools and resources needed to protect themselves, which is a much more sustainable model by putting the community at the helm of the framework. Um, and then finally is the all hazards approach. Um, so if all ecological and built projects fail, social resiliency can persist. It's the ultimate fail-back plan. So if we look at uh, seawalls, for example, seawalls are helpful for coastal flooding and storms. But in the case of a heat wave, seawalls are useless. Whereas social resiliency, as we said before, is useful for all sorts of disruptions. Now we can't talk about social resiliency without recognizing vulnerability. So here we see a definition of community vulnerability as a measure of both the sensitivity of a population uh, to natural hazards and its ability to respond to and recover from the impacts of hazards. Um, so this tells us that there are certain communities that are more vulnerable than others, um, which should be known and we're going to now explore that further by highlighting what are some vulnerable populations. This just includes the elderly, disabled, non-native English speakers, geographically isolated, substance abusers, homeless, children with needs, impoverished, undocumented residents, single parent households. It's important to list each of these to recognize that there are those who are particularly vulnerable at times of disaster. And with a focus on New York City, it's also important to recognize that there is a high population of each of these vulnerable groups. So we'd now like to introduce the concept of denaturalizing disaster. Oftentimes, environmental disruptions are seen as natural disasters, quote unquote, that have devastating impacts. However, it is now widely understood that the impacts of environmental disruptions are not evenly distributed throughout society. Although academia has been focusing on this for a number of years, Hurricane Katrina demonstrated to the public just how disproportionate the impacts were. So this specific study, uh, Eric Kleinberg, sociologist at NYU, looked at a heat wave in Chicago in the mid-90s um, and essentially created a social autopsy of disaster. Um, and by, it looked at the social underpinnings of adversity in the face of disruption, which was a heat wave in this uh, specific case study. And to set a control for this study, uh, the authors studied two low-income communities with different cultural compositions and systemic inequalities, um, and noted the difference in deaths and community resiliency. The study demonstrated the significance of social networks and cohesion as a means for social resiliency. So I'm just going to read out this quote because it's pretty important. The close social ties in many of Chicago's Latino communities, extending through several generations and sustained by better neighborhood conditions, help maintain the vitality of collective life and ensure that the most precarious members are looked after. Um, so we want to contextualize the importance of social resiliency as a protection against climate change, which is the net warming of the world caused by um, human, human emitted greenhouse gases. Um, the effects of climate change are many and lead to impacts all over, all over the world, from sea level rise causing flooding in Bangladesh to the rising temperatures causing desertification of the, of the Sahel, as well as the melting Antarctic ice sheets. Um, there are a lot of global, global impacts, but there's also one that hit very close to home in Hurricane Sandy, which, happened, which made landfall on October 29, 2012. Although Hurricane Sandy was an improbable storm with only a 1 in 700 chance of happening, which cannot be easily causally linked to climate change, it is a predictor of things to come out of climate change due to the sea level rise as well as the intensification of extreme weather patterns. Hurricane Sandy caused a huge shift in focus in um, New York City's climate resilience, climate change agenda. Pre-Sandy, we had 2007's Plan NYC under Mayor Bloomberg, which was more focused on climate change generally, making the city sustainable and green. But in the wake of Sandy, the, oops, but in the wake of Sandy, um, the, the city's agenda shifted from sustainability to resiliency and making sure that NYC could withstand the impacts of climate change, namely from coastal flooding. This was epitomized by Plan NYC's A Stronger, More Resilient New York Report, or SIR, which created 257 initiatives designed to increase New York City's resiliency. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that. So we'd now like to take you through our methodology, what we've been doing in the past four months. Um, so our first task of the Capstone Seminar was to do an extensive review of literature on the topics of ecological, built, and social resiliency. 
Altogether, we reviewed over 120 sources spanning the disciplines of sociology, urban planning, ecology, engineering, politics, environmental studies, economics, and urban studies. This goal is to strengthen our state of knowledge, to understand what has already been done, how different people understand it, and what are gaps in the field of resiliency. Then to see how these principles and theories were, oper were uh, operationalized, we explored um, a number of cities um, and we, we looked into their comprehensive climate resiliency plans. And the cities we reviewed included Rotterdam, Copenhagen, London, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Each had a unique set of hazards and risks as well as a number of obstacles, regulatory or financial, or otherwise, to their implementation. Each also showcased locally based solutions to address those unique risks and challenges. Given that our research is based in New York City, we wanted to highlight a number of important local case studies that have also sought to operationalize the principles of resiliency. This ranged from analyzing critical infrastructure, like the Coney Island Hospital, to a community-based organization focused on social resiliency, like Upgroups. Each of our case studies in New York City showed how different organizations have different frameworks for tackling climate resiliency. So these were really uh, critical in us understanding what is happening in New York City and what can we learn from. Finally, we got into our stage of site analysis. So we did a site analysis that employed public life studies methodology